Okay, so I've, I've got a title here that's kind of slightly dramatic because um, I'm trying to liven it up a little bit. It's not quite that dramatic because it's really we're only talking about social networks. But I think you know what I'm really trying to illustrate is there's two waves that have, there's a wave that's already occurred and there's a second wave that's coming. Um, we know that um, we're kind of in the calm before the second wave hits, right? So we've had our first wave where we kind of know the favourites that came from the Western world. We had Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've got YouTube, we've got Instagram, we've got LinkedIn, we've got this, this set that we all kind of know and love, right? We've kind of, you know, we've got lots of people using it. In fact, 93% of us are using it to present our brands or promote our brands online. We're also used to kind of the massive numbers that presents to us, right? So I'm sure you guys have all seen the videos online which kind of talk about these massive global numbers which to me always kind of blow my mind which is kind of, you know, 4.5 billion daily likes, um, 6 billion hours of um, YouTube video watched every month on YouTube. These, are, these kind of statistics that kind of say to us that this is a massive network and it doesn't really mean a lot to us but they're kind of impressive numbers, right? 500 million tweets sent per day, 7 million, 70 million Instagram photographs and videos shared every day. They're kind of massive numbers. And we've kind of become very comfortable with this kind of network, this social network framework. We've got the ones we know. We've kind of learned how to start using Facebook. We've learned how to use Twitter. We've learned Instagram. We've learned a whole bunch of different stuff, right, about these social networks set. But what we, what, what we kind of have to realize is that that's the kind of the first wave. And the second wave is coming through, and it's coming through really rapidly. That first set, kind of came from the Western world. So the, the Americans and the, you know, the Europeans, they were developing these networks and they were kind of, we were adopting them based on our cultural affinity with those, net, those, those cultures. And they were becoming kind of the thing that was kind of natural to us. The second wave that's coming through is being driven by a whole bunch of you know, different um, kind of forces that are driving it, right? So the first force that's driving it, so before, we get, before I get into telling you what the second wave is, one of the forces that's kind of driving it is the fact that, you know, the whole mobilization of what we're doing, right? So in Australia now, we currently have 1.3 handsets per person. I'm not sure what we do with the 1.3 or the 0.3. Um, it doesn't sound very useful to me, but it's, yeah, there is a massive number of handsets in Australia. We are spending 60% of our time where everything we access online is 60% of that time is spent through our mobile device. So it's kind of, you know, we're now swinging away from our desktop into our mobile system. In fact, the number of connected devices is going to outstrip the world population by 2016, next year. So 7.2 billion people is the projected, projected world population. We're going to have 10 billion devices on the planet, um, which is a massive kind of number, which means that people are like two or three devices sitting in their hands. That's one of the things that's kind of driving it. The other thing that's driving it is that where we used to rely on kind of the telco planet. So the first warning was when in 2012, when the number of instant messages being sent by mobile devices or by chat apps and messaging apps outstripped SMS apps or SMS services from telco. That was in 2012. This year we're gonna have 50 billion instant messages sent by messaging, um, by mobile apps and 21 billion sent by, um, by telco services. So we're shifting away from the expensive telco services. We're now moving into a world where the telco has lo is losing around $32.6 billion a year to these chat apps, right? So this whole thing is shifting away from, so the, the idea of the telco dominating the planet is now in the mobile world. We're now in a space where in the, the bulk of the population around Asia, they can't afford the telco costs, so they're moving across to free services, so free chat, free VoIP, all those kind of aspects, and the telcos lose. The strange thing is that the chat app actually relies on the telco's network. So the telco is still spending $3.4 billion in Australia to support a network for free services that run across the top of it. So it's kind of this whole dynamics moving around where the telco hasn't quite got its shit together, the days of double-digit growth of mobile services for telco is kind of dying. The revenue is dropping out of the market. Um, it's a scary time for the operator. So people are shifting away. The other force that's working towards it is the fact that smartphones are now becoming quite cheap. So if you look in Southeast Asia, you can now get a fully-featured smartphone for $50 or less. 
That's kind of being driven out of the Chinese market. And the idea that you know, Apple in this country is a dominating force, in Southeast Asia there's no presence for Apple at all. So it doesn't actually represent any part of the mix of handsets that are going into Southeast Asia. So now the, with the cost of handsets coming down, everybody now is starting to look at the mobile service as the way to connect to the internet. So that's the only way they can connect. So you don't have poles and wires in Southeast Asia. You basically use your mobile phone to connect to the internet. That's the only way you're kind of getting online. And in that market, we have kind of 600 million people in the middle class and smartphone owners who are kind of driving this whole adoption thing. So there's the wave, the next wave we're getting is kind of all this smart, these chat apps that are coming out of Southeast Asia. So they're the next wave of, so they're the new social networks we have to deal with. So we've been used to the Facebooks and the Twitters and the YouTubes and the, and the whatevers. And now this whole new world is kind of popping up and coming through to us. It hasn't quite hit our shores yet. We're still kind of quite happy with Facebooks and the Twitters and the Instagrams. But now with the whole shift where you've got low access, low cost access through mobile phones to the internet, you've got low cost handsets going into the Southeast Asian countries, um, this is kind of starting to drive a whole massive adoption process around smart um, chat apps. And Facebook, to these guys, is really like taking going to a party with your grandparents. It's really shifting away from and I know we've only just come to terms with the whole Facebook, Facebook phenomenon. We're actually now starting to kind of, you know, use it effectively from a marketing perspective. But it's really now becoming a little bit old hat. And we think that's kind of just the younger dem de demographic. It's actually not quite the younger demographic. If you look at the top six social networks globally, four of those are actually chat apps. So you've got WeChat, we've got F F Facebook Messenger, you've got WhatsApp, and you've got QQ. QQ being the largest with 829 million users. And these guys, that's coming out of China, but that is now in five or six different languages. It's now starting to sneak into our country, right? So what we're doing is we're kind of still focused over here where this tsunami is coming through, which is all around the, 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 the instant messaging kind of chat environment. Even in Australia, we, we already have 2.4 million users on the WhatsApp platform. So it's starting to actually kind of show us that it's actually being adopted quite widely. I mean, we haven't necessarily really kind of come to terms with how to market through it, but we're really kind of starting to see the growth that's already happening in Australia. If you look at them globally, the top, the top nine messaging apps, if you're looking at the Lines, the WeChats, the WhatsApp, the Katow Talk, the Facebook Messenger, Snapchat, Kik, Viber, and Tango, they already have 3.7 billion active users inside their networks. And they're already sharing a billion pieces of content every day. So it's like, you know, they're now reaching, we kind of got used to those big numbers associated with our first wave. Our second wave is now getting to a point where it's getting similar numbers or even bigger numbers. And I think that's something we've got to kind of, you know, work out how we deal with. It's two times what Facebook and Instagram send combined. The interesting thing about these networks that are coming out of Asia is that they're very much focused around joy and uh, kind of fun rather than what are the Western networks were very much faced, fo focused around, which was kind of the functional aspects. So you kind of got this world where, you know, we've got used to this kind of functional delivery through Facebook and Twitter and those kind of things, which are tools, whereas what the, um, the Asian networks are doing, these chat apps are doing, is they're introducing a whole concept of joy and fun around how you communicate and how you connect with your family and your loved ones. And it's not just the kind of younger demographic, it's now 40% of the, the users across this platform are around 25 to 34 years of age. So anybody kind of in the marketing game would be interested in this kind of demographic. I was standing in a, in a queue in a Bangkok airport and I was standing right at the back of the queue and I was looking down the queue and every single person on that queue with their mobile phones, because they're all playing with their mobile phones waiting for their turn to check into the airline. Every single person had Line, which is the, the kind of Thai-based kind of you know, chat app on their screen. They're all like, this is businessmen, this is teenagers, this is all the people. Everybody in that queue was kind of using Line to communicate. Well, I was working with a company in, that, in, in Thailand and they had a, a Line channel and they had 23 million um, followers in that channel. So while it's happening up there, it's starting to kind of influence into Australia. They were, they were all about the sort of SMS and free voicemail. So they're all about that kind of idea that you, know, you, you could avoid paying telco costs by using these apps to actually communicate with your loved ones and your friends, and you do it for free, they're now realizing that after they've got this massive injection, they've built a massive um, population of users, 
they've got a lot of investment from the investors that says, yeah, we think you've got a, got a future. They're now going to have to work out how to make money. So they're now all moving into rich content, they're all moving into games, they're all moving into shopping, they're all moving into sharing. So they're all moving into where they used to be, which was all about the kind of free communication space. They're now moving very much into that kind of content space, that shopping space, that retail space. So what in, in effect is, become, is happening is these guys are now starting to ch challenge the Googles and the Facebooks of the planet. They're so really now, with their volume of people, the, their markets are now maturing to a point they're now looking beyond their markets, so they're all going, hang on, well, okay, we're, we're in our Southeast Asian markets, now let's look, about, look, look broader afield, let's look at the Western markets. Just a quick couple of screenshots to show you kind of how they're evolving. So this is kind of the line environment, and you can see there that there's like AIS is the guys that have the 23 million, million followers. Um, so that's your kind of your chat portion of your, your app. But they're also now delivering kind of rich content through there. So they're de delivering panels through their content. Um, you can spend hours in there fishing around and you know, kind of having a good time in there. And the brands are getting in there. You can share. If you look at Tango, is any of you guys actually using kind of chat apps? Yeah? Yep. So Tango is another one which is really interesting. They've kind of gone very much down the channels and the content feed and news feed space. There, kind of, you know, can see you can see the people around you. You can start to, you know, tap into the channels. You can get soccer news. You can get a whole bunch of really rich content in there, which is kind of really interesting evolution for these guys because they're trying to work out how they can get other brands in there to pay for the the space that sits within that and how they can tap into these large audiences that they're built. Because the investors are saying we now want to return on our money, which is kind of you know the evolution of things, and that'll start to consolidate. You can have people. Um, the games in Tango are really quite fun because you, you, you actually play within Tango. So you're playing people within your contact list. You're challenging them. You're having lots of fun around kind of, you know, highest score, best race, all those kind of aspects. Um, and it can become quite addictive. And then also they're developing the in-app kind of purchasing model where you, you can get a faster car if you spend 50 bucks. You can get weapons on your car if you spend 80 bucks. There's a whole bunch of ways they're actually kind of starting to drive their revenue. So it's, the point being, so from a single point of entry with mass following, which is what we're used to with the Facebook kind of area, where we all kept our stuff in one, kind of one or two places. We're kind of using Instagram or we're using Twitter or we're using Facebook. Now we're kind of getting into an area where it's a fractured ecosystem, right? So it's like it's across it's multiple points. And these places don't have a destination for a brand. It's all about the kind of bits and pieces you can put within it. It's all driven around a utility, which is the communication service. So you can see that like, you know, with Facebook, it was all about connecting with your family and your friends. With the chat apps, it's all about kind of how do I, I can communicate via SMS, I can do voice calls, I can do, so there's utility within the app. And then there's also um, kind of, you know, the wider piece, which is the content and the content groups. And it's all becoming like you know, a point where from our perspective, which we're talking about marketing or design or any of those aspects, we're really now talking about every single piece of content is kind of its own portal to a brand. We don't, the key point being that a mob, the mobile has no homepage, right? So we're all used to this idea where we're actually kind of, you know, we'd, we'd set up a destination within Facebook or we'd set up a Twitter handle. We do, so it's all based around destination. And people would come in and they'd follow us and they'd like us and we kind of build a whole bunch of, um, you know, kind of, you know, equity around that kind of group. Now with this whole sort of instant messaging kind of social platform development, there is no homepage, there is no destination. It's about how you can leverage all the small pieces of content that you put in there and how you actually bring that together as a whole, which is quite an interesting kind of challenge for all of us from a design and a marketing perspective. They give us things like cards. They give us messages. They give snaps, vines, tweet feeds. They give us stickers. They give us game features. There's all these kind of piecemeal bits and pieces which we have to now start to get our heads around if this is the way we're going from a second wave of social networks, if this is where we're kind of heading towards the whole idea that it's all about the chat app environment rather than the big social platform, we have to work out how we can pull together all these little pieces into a cohesive story, which is kind of an interesting challenge, right? An example is like, you know, One Direction, God bless them. Um, they put up a, a Kik card, so Kik introduced this card concept within their um, social network. And Kik is quite a popular network in Australia. There's quite a few users of Kik. You know, I know my kids use it. Um, 
they announced that they had sort of 145 million unique key cards, but what really underneath that was the idea they only had 32 different types of key cards. So that means that each key card had been installed on a user profile 4 million times, which is quite a massive number. I know One Direction is going to have a, going to have a disproportionate effect and there's going to be a younger demographic inside Kik. But the idea of actually grabbing hold of that kind of that idea that there's these cards and elements, so you really all you've got is this piecemeal effect where you kind of do, you drop a card in, you see what the effect is, you do a, a short form video, you drop that into Twitter. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a unique kind of planet to be in. And it's personal, right? So it's thus for, it, you know, this whole thing about if you're going to interrupt someone's chat environment, so chat we actually understand is something I'm talking to a particular person from a chat perspective, I'm having a good old yarn with them. If a brand's going to interrupt that very personal experience, then you've got to have a really good reason to actually interrupt it. So the idea of using these tools that they're starting to give us, because these networks now have to generate the revenue to survive, if we can actually then work out how we then create value for users within those networks, that'll actually give us the kind of the key to unlocking kind of these chat networks, because that's really where it's going. And a guy, Hong Min from, um, from VNG, which is a content network out of Viet Vietnam, he kind, of he kind of sums it up really nicely. He kind of says like Western companies have tended to innovate earlier and faster due to the concentration of talent in the early market mass. So we've been further ahead as far as smartphone you know, adoption and all those kind of aspects. Nowadays, Asian companies also have the large markets. So there's now a massively growing middle class. Um, there's a massively growing kind of smartphone user population. They're going to start innovating, and they are out innovating, the Western companies. So if you think about wave one, which is all about the Western networks, which we've become accustomed to, now we have to start working on wave two, which is like how we actually start dealing with the next wave, which is the chat apps, the messaging apps, because they're now going to become the dominant space as we swing far, further and further across into the mobile space. What happens in that space? The other guys have been a bit late and a bit laggy to get into that space. As we know, these guys have kind of become beginning to dominate with their massive populations and it's starting to hit our shores. And as far as like it hitting us, it's definitely coming fast. It's definitely one of those things that we have to grapple with as kind of how we communicate and how we deliver content and whatever else. We actually have to start, and I know I don't think many of us would actually be doing marketing across those platforms at the moment. Is anybody doing kind of communication or marketing across those platforms? I think it's a really interesting challenge for how we go forward from a social network perspective because the swing is going to happen where as we go more and more into the mobile space, these apps, these environments or these platforms are going to become the dominant platforms and we're going to get less and less reliant on our Facebooks and our Twitters and our YouTubes and whatever else. We're going to be more reliant on our short messaging, our personal, our direct, and we need to work out how to deal with that. They haven't evolved that far yet. I think like, you know, the first evolution is that these environments are now looking to get kind of consumer brands in because that's an obvious fit with the, the demographic. From a B2B perspective, over the years, I imagine them developing those streams where they can actually, like, you know, you can see how Facebook then became, you know, birthed Yammer, that birthed all these kind of internal social networks from a B2B perspective. So you can imagine that occurring. You can imagine them migrating in with a B2B offer or someone coming in with a B2B offer because um, that would lower their telecommunication costs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's a long way. I mean, this is really just beginning to hit our shores. And it's kind of really the idea is that you know, it's going to happen as faster than we really want it to happen. So maybe over time, B2B. Um, so LinkedIn's done a really good job of kind of content and, you know, driving thought leadership around kind of, you know, the you know, whole LinkedIn business professional space. Maybe there's going to be one of these environments that pops up that is very much around B2B, sharing content, thought leadership as well. So I think the legacy guys have got so much invested in their kind of omni-platform kind of approach that they're kind of, they treat mobile as a kind of secondary arm or a third arm or whatever else. They don't kind of, these guys are completely focused on mobile. They don't care about desktop. They don't care about anything else. All they care about is the fact that you, you're accessing them through a mobile screen. So everything about them is mobile. And I think that's what's important about these guys. So I can imagine B2B coming in the second wave or third wave or whatever. That prediction has been made many times, I think. It's like email's gonna die. Um, I think email is one of these things that's kind of uh, so ingrained in business it's going to take a long time. It's a bit like the book, right? We all said the book was going to die when Amazon went through the roof and 
you know, there's going to be no more printed materials and there's going to be paperless offices, and we all know that's not true, right? So I can't imagine it killing email. I think it's one of these things where it's now a very personal experience between friends and family. And I think it's now going to migrate because the brands are going to introduce themselves into these environments and they're going to start driving a lot of kind of non-personal kind of interaction. I think then you'll start to see it's just going to be a different stream for communication and marketing, really. It's where you explore and where you touch brands, where you engage and interact with brands. <laughs> taking that line... No, but taking that line of thought, right? You know, everything is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So, you know, we went from the social network, which was shorter than our kind of, you know, our long form and our writing and our letters and that kind of stuff. We went to so email, which is shorter format. We then went into social networks where we started to develop a language which was kind of less formal. We then went into SMS, which was like abbreviations and, you know, you uh, and all that kind of stuff, right, to abbreviate. We're now getting into a format which is even shorter than that, right? So no longer do we have long form marketing and those kind of things. So I think you could, uh, you could summarize that we are getting, our attention span gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So I think, yeah, that's a good question. So like, you know, if you look at some of them, they're already now translating into different languages. So they're now translating into English and to Japanese and to Arabic and whatever else. So I think they've originated in their very, very kind of culturally fitted kind of space. I think they're now going, okay, well, it's so competitive out there, particularly in the Southeast Asian markets. If you go to Thailand, there's like, you know, lines doing TV advertising, doing billboards, doing bus, sh bus sides, doing all that kind of stuff, right? So I think there's a huge amount of competition in that space. And I think what they're faced is, okay, how do I then now extend myself beyond my current kind of borders? And they're looking at, that's part of their strategy, right, is to start saying, well, if I go into Japan, so Lion went into Japan and cut a massive deal with a content provider over there to kind of launch big time in Japan, and that's like, you know, a like, you know, $50 million project. So I think they're, they're really starting to contextualise themselves around the cultures. It hasn't really... We're, we're adopting them based around the fact that we hear about them, we think they're kind of cool and sexy, so we start using them. I think they're going to start looking to localise them around Australia eventually. Let's face it, we're a tiny portion of the Southeast Asian market, right? We're, we're 23 billion, mi billion, million people um, versus, you know, those guys that are 300 million, 100 million, you know what I mean? It's like we are kind of a tiny target, um, but we, we, it will kind of hit because we've got a lot of people who, are, you know, come from those cultures who kind of bring it in with, it, with them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think it's like, you know, that, that's part of what, I'm, what, what I was trying to say is that they will start to localise, they will start to look at us as being maybe an entry into brands, right? We have, we have a smorgasbord of brands which will far outweighs the value of our market because we demand to have choice. I always remember Black & Decker telling me that, you know, they wanted to come into this market, they only wanted to bring kind of 12 products because that was really all they could support in this market, but we demanded that they bought all 50 products, right? So... It's kind of, we have this kind of expectation from America and England or wherever else that we, we want the full smorgasbord or wherever it is. So maybe they see that as an entry point for some of the bigger brands, I don't know. We haven't started, we've kind of, we're only touching the tip of the iceberg as well. Um, I think brands aren't necessarily, if, you've met, if you talk to them about it, they kind of go, yeah, 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 but what are you doing in Facebook, right? So it's, it's very much around that kind of approach. Um, we've got to try and develop up and we don't, no one, I think, knows how to use this kind of fragmented or fractured kind of environment. We all kind of got, just got used to the idea of how you manage a Facebook page effectively, you know, how you build all the kind of policies and procedures around a big businesses, like, you know, entry into social media. We haven't kind of, you know, we've got to test it, basically, and see what the kick card does and see what our, yeah, it's, a, it's about risk mitigation in the social networks. It's, that's where it tends to come from within big brand, in, in my head. And like, you know, how you had conversations and how you... Cause, being authentic. Yeah, being authentic, across. yes. But now we've got to be... Now we're going to inject ourselves into a really personal space. And it's kind of like, you know, how do you do that without being offensive? How do you do that without kind of driving people? Yeah, exactly, right? So it's a different paradigm. And I think there's like, you know, we need to think, work out how that actually comes together. So I know, I know one example, which is the telco in Thailand. There's a brand in that space. And they, they've gone through the roof. Their first couple of times they put sort of, you know, content into their channel, they had massive engagement. 
and that's dramatically dropped off. That's kind of you know gone through the floor as it's you know, as they've done more and more. So what they did is they got that work. Let's put another one. In. Oh, that, that's worked as well. We'll put another one. Oh my god, that's pulled. Oh my god. 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 They've just dropped lots and lots of content in there. So they haven't really. They've kind of gone overboard. And I think like you know the engagement. It's got that's the careful balancing act you've got to do. I think at the moment I think it's really strong because it's it's a new kind of area. And that kind of comes back to um, the gentleman there. It's coming about like the shorter attention spans. I think we're kind of, you know, this is a group of networks that are coming down to us, and they are they're the hot ones at the moment. But then they'll kind of consolidate and kind of you know, but they're being driven by a need to generate revenue. So they're kind of constantly trying to reinvent themselves and offer new services and kind of you know new ways for them to make money. So they're keeping themselves refreshed. And as long as they can keep themselves refreshed strong enough, they'll kind of and have something new on a regular basis. I think they can get some strong engagement, but there will be a, a time when they kind of go, and they'll plummet. Facebook, no, no, MySpace.